Welcome. Uh, we are here today joined by some extraordinary guests for our Herasis Extraordinary Meeting. My name is Carol Barrow. I'm a public relations uh, specialist, founder of SanFranciscoWriter.com, a full service communications consultancy, which provides thought leadership, media relations, um, and communications for biotech, medtech, and high-tech startups and global companies. I'm honored to be moderating this discussion on how globally accepted goals change our behavior for the Harasis Extraordinary Meeting, again, with some extraordinary panelists who I'll introduce now. We have with us Ned Clunin, Chairman of Ned Clunin Associates, based here in the U.S., Hi, Ned. How are you doing? Thank you. Great. We have Virginie Houdoudon. Hello. Yeah. Executive Director of Your Public Value, a Berlin-based NGO company. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. And we have Stacy Kenworthy, Chairman Asylum Capital, based here in the U.S. as well. Hi, Stacy. Hey. Hello. And we also are joined by Jerry Wang, CEO of Hi2 Global USA. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Carol. How are you? Great. I'm doing wonderful. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, some of the points that we'll be touching on include uh, how sustainable development goals permit local interpretations and how those investments are being felt in local communities. And also on a, on a more macro scale, what are nations doing to promote the economic benefit of the SDGs that boost growth in business while they also elevate social goals? So what will energize firms to meet their SDGs is a really big part of that, a big component of actually bringing that ideation into realization. So if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to start off with you, Virginie, with a few questions. Uh, since you come from the NGO back, I figure you might have quite a bit of insight into um, what could be a key first move for, for any company to change. Hmm. Um, thank you, Carol. You see, um, I serve to be like all of us, I guess, uh, the Arasis Forum uh, earlier today. And seems that we're all like-minded. There's a lot of talks about uh, the, the, the focus on the human experience, uh, what COVID brought, uh, the importance of the societal and environmental challenges. All that is nice. But I... I think when you are inside a company, the question comes, um, how? Okay, it's nice, uh, we're all like-minded, but what can we do and how do we do that? And um, we've, um, we've worked uh, quite a lot with sustainability experts and also experts uh, uh, from, from corporations and, and from the private sector to really understand their ecosystem and their challenges. And yes. there's one simple thing that one can do is <clears throat> if you look at your stakeholder map and you add society and the environment as active stakeholders, it means you can see them as being stakeholders of your company, that changes entirely the strategic intent. Mm. Uh, if you look at who has been positively and who has been negatively impacted, be the environment, communities, doesn't really matter, but absolutely put everything on the table and mm. look at the positive, the positively impacted ones and the negatively impacted ones. You then need to take corrective action to really help those who are negatively impacted. And you can find some opportunities when you deep, you know, you dig deeper into the, the positively impacted. So we work a lot uh, with, uh, with, with companies in trying to uh, advocate this approach. Like it's no longer enough to 
to say that we want to be sustainable or we're looking at carbon emission, you know, 30 years down the road. I coached someone earlier today. It was 50 years down the road. Say, come on, we don't <laughs> have 50 years. None yeah. of us. And yeah. now our children do yes. not either. So 50 years, no, forget it. That means zero. But if you have even five years or 10 years, how are you going to do it? Well, that, that's an approach, for example. And are you finding that that approach is giving them a little bit more of a framework of a sense of urgency and maybe a reframing for more ambitious goals, given the reality of where we are in, you know, regards to climate change, which we can't wait, as you said, we can't wait 50 years in the future. So is that coming? Are you seeing a lot of effectiveness with that? kind of highlighting who's benefiting from things and and who are the stakeholders don't take me wrong i mean all initiatives are good and i i, I think we need to encourage them uh but they are just a little bit like the nice cherries on the cakes right <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense if sustainability is not included at the core of the strategy intent it doesn't <laughs> really change uh, things. Uh, I, I'll be very happy to hear what uh, Jerry thinks about that because he's on the investment uh, part. And uh, I think what we need to do, what is very urgent today, is to bridge profit and, and sustainability, to make mm -hmm. sure that there are opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a world that can be very appealing to business. Uh, but it takes a particular approach, a particular methodology. It uh, means that dialogue and not only communications, not marketing, but dialogue needs to come uh, in. And, and uh, we need to develop the skill of listening and integrating uh, feedback, whatever the feedback is, to transform and to get into uh, a field where you have a lot of new opportunities. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned Jerry because uh, when we were chatting earlier, Jerry said something that really resonated with me, which is that ultimately it pays to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I'd love to, Jerry, if you'd like to jump in, I'd love to touch on um, how you approach the topic. And I know you primarily focus on ESGs um, and how actually kind of in investments and leveraging the power of investing in emerging markets is uh, very much hand in hand and complementary to achieving the goals of many of the SDGs. That yeah, we of course. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I mean, uh, we've been investing in ESG in emerging markets for five years now, and mm -hmm. uh, we have seen the landscape in changing and uh, the stakeholders are more aligned nowadays. And we can see, you know, not just NGOs, not just investors, not just like public companies in the government, you know, um, we are aligning the right incentives, like that you mentioned, do the right thing. And for example, you know, the Biden administration, the Chinese government, they're promoting, you know, protect the environment and switch to EV by like 2050, 2060. You know, they wouldn't do that before, you know, because China was like, it, they are sacrificing growth and, you know, to protect the environment. It's like they're doing the right thing, but you have to have the right incentive for the old stakes are doing the same thing. And uh, so from inspector, inspector, you know, uh, so from our perspective, investor's perspective, are we willing to sacrifice returns, you know, to to achieve those goals? And the, the good thing is like, we don't have to, you know, so we're doing the good thing and generate the, the good returns. So that's, that's even better, right? So mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. And, uh, so eventually if we're on the same page or we're, or we're, you know, moving toward the same goals, everybody benefits. It's like you, you, you might have to sacrifice for the shorter term. Like, like I mentioned, Chinese GDP is coming down a little bit. And, uh, but with the right incentives, government, you know, environmental protection is for the long term. It's for sustainable growth, right? It's not, you sacrifice your growth. It's just like, make it more, you know, uh, sustainable, more long-term and uh, for the next generation, you know, uh, that's, that's uh, I think uh, we've been seeing in the past five years, you know, everybody realized 
and uh, you might have to, but you don't have to, you know, sacrifice and right now to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think that there is that shift to uh, longer term sort of uh, trajectory and looking into um, how, how things that may be an initial investment and may not seem like the um, shortest route to profit initially really will have those long-term benefits, not only for the companies, but also for the society at large. Um, and I know, Stacy, that you know you, you often approach the topic from a business perspective as somebody who has seen that corporate activism is on the rise and that within companies, especially in the um, tech industry, there's been a demographic shift and that often the, the motivation and the impetus for making these changes are kind of coming from grassroots within the, within the companies and it's finally kind of permeating up to leadership. Is that something that you could expand upon a little bit, something that you Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I can speak to it from the business perspective, but in particular from the technology business perspective. Um, and the technology industry kind of is a leading, I think, indicator of kind of the thought in the, in the business community. A um, lot because the you know we tend to skew younger in terms of the demographic and the participants in the business, and so we're kind of more attuned to some of the societal cues, I guess. Uh, and in the tech business, you know, we, it's really been driven by two factors. I mean, I think tech entrepreneurs in particular would really like to do the right thing for, for the world. There is a long-term perspective. I think there is the, you know, the, you know, what, like Jerry was saying, there's the attitude that this is better for the long term. We can create more value if we do it in the right way. Um, there's no longer, as in the past, it used to be you might be punished for taking resources and doing something that was outside of you know, purely generating a product. I think that attitude is, is now long past in, in, in good riddance. Uh, now, if there's any doubt, and I do know some folks that do doubt whether the SG is a good thing, it's not, it, it's, it's not do they need to do it. They know they need to do it. It's because if they don't, there will be an impact down the road. If you don't address this now, you have a, a future liability that will come into play. And, of course, everyone looks at that and says if there's a future liability, then that means there's a liability today. So it's just better to address it now. So the mm -hmm. fact that there's a level playing field uh, that everybody has to play to, I think, from a business perspective, gives the, the business folks the opportunity to really uh, push it without having you know, one subset of stakeholders, like stockholders, for example, say that they don't like it. That being said, the stockholders are really looking at this as well. You know, Jerry can speak it from the capital markets perspective. They're expecting companies to toe the line. They're expecting to build a long-term sustainable value proposition. Um, so you look at it from that perspective as where you need to go and what inputs do you need? Well, a huge part of in the tech business, the inputs are, you know, frankly, there's capital. And from Jerry's perspective, the cap, you know, folks that are supplying capital or having this as a checklist item. So you need to do it anyway, even if, you know, no matter what. And frankly, the inputs are, are human capital. Uh, and to recruit, uh, you, you find that the, you know the the best of the best, which of course every tech business is trying to recruit, tend to be the most socially conscious as well. They tend they you want exactly. you're building your company on top of your human capital, and you want the best human capital. They actually have demands now. It's not like the old days where you just could tell them what to do and they would do it. They're very selective. They can work for any one of a number of companies. And, and not just recruiting them out of college. They, you know, they, you have to be competitive to get them to join your company. But if they get in there and they find they don't like it, they've got five job offers. Um, so it's an incredibly competitive environment, and this is important to them. So if you look at human capital as a as a factor, um, which certainly the tech business does, then you really need to be addressing these issues because it's important to the people that are making up your company as much as it is to the people that are consuming whatever your product is. So, so would you say that now sustainability is very much tied into talent acquisition and, and the overall reputation of the company as, as you're recruiting younger tech workers? Absolutely. And I know that's true for the tech industry in particular, but I also work with a lot, I know a lot of CEOs from, from different industries. Everybody's facing that challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even in, even in industries that you wouldn't think would, would necessarily be there, like you know, energy, oil and gas, you're thinking, well, these guys can't be environmental right. economists. But they are. The younger generation is, and they're coming at it from a way that says, look, we understand that we can't switch everything to renewables overnight, 
but there's got to be a way to make this sustainable. Um, right. So it's not just so it's kind of all business, really. It's not it's not just tech. Um, mm-hmm. I think tech just you know maybe got there a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah, as they often do, the the early adopters among us, right, mm-hmm. are, are in the tech world. Um, well, also moving along to you, Ned. I know that as part of your work, you you advise a lot of C-suite executives and investors and business right. and, and external relations strategies, and I'm sure a large part of that uh, tends to uh, incorporate how to approach SDGs and and what their impact might be on overall strategy of the companies that you're advising. Is right. is there um, or have there been some changes or any movement in that direction that you've seen? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with much of what has been said so far, but I would like to come at this a little differently, like with a little different perspective, if you will, for the sake of discussion and debate. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we have, you know, we have a president of the United States that called this issue climate change existential, right? I mean, and if you look that up, it's as of or related to human existence, right? Um, he's also charged every government agency and every thing that he controls to build a climate change agenda within their own organization and to be able to speak to it. Really kind of extraordinary. But you know, and also, you know, like, but that, but it also says that we are, this, this issue now is very much in a different political place than it ever was. And when you do that, things change, right? Yes, you have the, I agree with the early adopter, West Coast, San Francisco <laughs> thing. And in the political process, you are considered elitist. Uh, you are considered people who are in a echo chamber and you talk to yourself every day, you know, all day, right? And you invest that way and you make money that way. I mean, I'm just being a little bit of a, you know, just, that's true. But, you know, and, um, you know, but I'm going to posit the idea that we, let's say in this country, we have a long, much longer way to go than anybody probably on this call, including myself, you know, you know, really believe that it's going to take to convince the overriding number of people in this country about where climate change activists want the United States to go. Right? Mm-hmm. It's a bigger, more complicated discussion. So how, where, where is the country moving then? How, will, how is the average American going to see this go forward, right? Well, it's going to go forward you know, visibly for them, and it will be debated actively before them, you know, with two critical pieces of legislation that are already out there, right? Mm-hmm. And we got the the Innovation and Competition Act, right? Right. right. Which is the first thing that's come out, $120 billion to the National Science Foundation, right? Now, the I'm talking about the average voter now. I'm not talking about San Francisco, you know, investors and, you know, and, New York City, Wall Street types. Oh, still elitist. <laughs> you know, they're gonna, you know, it's it's they're gonna be looking carefully at this, right? And the the point I would like to make is that the United States, with these, with with both the Innovation and Competition Act, as long as with this Build Back America Infrastructure Act, we are moving closer than ever before to industrial policy, right? Something that the United States has gone around the world and argued against for my entire professional career, right? But we are now there. We look more like Europe than Europe looks like itself, right, right now, right? And we're, you know, with industrial policy, you're picking winners and losers. You know, uh, with industrial politics, you know, industrial policy, politics, Trump. Mm-hmm the actual um, sort of uh, validation or the integrity of the actual deal itself or the project. The merit, the merit politics, of the project. Politics will always carry the day, in which case, so for example, like say, in the, I looked this up, in the Innovation and Competition Act, right? 
120 billion is going to go to the National Foundation. It doesn't, and I, I don't whether we think this should happen or not, but this is real. This is in there. And I took this this you know a quote out. There's a well, there's a new director of technology and information, right? Mm-hmm. And it says that the that grants will be allocated based on identity and geography. That, that's 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 right in here, right? Right. And then it says. Then they're going to have a new director of technology innovation, and they're going to have a separate chief diversity office. Mm-hmm. And, and the quote for the chief diversity office is, ensure funds are equitably distributed to create domestic jobs. Right. right? So this mm-hmm. is research. Now, I'm just trying to say this is the research foundation, right? Now, research is about ideas, not about jobs. But what I'm saying is this is going to be every, you know, every like this bill is going to now be like an additional jobs act as opposed mm-hmm. to what it was originally intended to be. And that is to generate new ideas, you know, and that gener- that turn into new businesses. This is, the focus is, is on jobs. And I'll give you one other thing here. And I read it. And this is it's AI scholarships. Everybody says that AI is like the critical thing to the future. And so they want to do a, this is great. And that a program for a significant amount of money is going to go to graduate and graduate students to study AI in this country. Some mm-hmm. of them do to compete against China, right? Well, if you look carefully at it, it says, but the only, it says, it says right in it, this is the language. The only institutions that can qualify for this money are those that attract a diverse and non-traditional student population, right? Okay. You know, I'm, I'm saying we can all think these are great goals. I'm just talking about how this gets presented to America, you know, in a political sense at some point, all right? So, so do you think that these uh, kind of stipulations are what are turning these into, bi- or into partisan issues and are holding them back from being... Well, what I'm saying is that, that I think, you know, you know, when you talk about what the nations need to do to get mm-hmm. close to where we want to be. I mean, if you eliminate a lot of this sort of political language in these very important bills that are going mm-hmm. to be directing money to get to climate change, then politically the best thing to do is not have this kind of language and these concepts in there, right? And, you know, I just add one thing, infrastructure. You know, the infrastructure bill, very, very important. No doubt about it. Bipartisan. Everybody knows that. But again, mm-hmm. industrial policy. Do you know what? The average infrastructure project in this country takes 12 years to get approved. Just that, to get approved. Sadly, just not approved. surprising. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but, but the real, and the, the, there's one piece of legislation passed in 1969 that has actually brought us to that figure. Right. And it's an important legislation, but it's the National Environmental Policy Act. Right. Which gave rise to the environmental impact statement and for the judicial rights to stop any construction project, you know, uh, you know, without, you know, and you don't even have to talk about the environment or not with it. Right. I'm just saying it. So we need to, like, change these things in these bills Mm-hmm. So we professionalize them, try to depoliticize them to the extent possible, which probably won't be possible. And the best thing we could do is make sure that that kind of stuff is not in there, right? And well, uh, and it's, and it's I, I, do, like, I do see what you mean about trying to make them kind of as politically neutral as possible in order to go ahead and get them enacted. That no, not politically neutral. I mean, I make them effective pieces of legislation so the job gets done. Well, by taking out some of the language that kind of uh, designates some of the the jobs, for instance, to be um, concentrated in areas that are um, for minority, uplifting minority communities, et cetera. So... Uh Yes. Can I I, uh, address this issue? I think language is everything. Language yeah. is the mirror of society and it embraces change and history. And uh, it, it's, 
I can I can see that you know there is some kind of a jargon and some usual terminology that is used and maybe abused these days, like it happens all the time throughout history. Yes, it marks your epoch, it marks your right. time. Mm -hmm. uh, to change language is actually uh, not going on with the flow. You, we really want to make sure that diversity creates jobs for the underrepresented. Absolutely. Uh, so it is indeed political, it is partisan. Um, and you cannot basically have a bill, neither in the United States nor anywhere around the world, being nonpartisan. That just doesn't exist, not right. even in the United States. So it, 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 no, I can say that as a French living in Germany and being <laughs> being a global citizen. It, it's, um, it, it's just a, a matter of acknowledging what this new language can bring. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's also a matter to avoid a, a, a split uh, in nations. We have seen the United States on the age of, of really uh, severe tensions. And so, of course, it will be partisan. Now, whether we like it or not is, is a different uh, uh, discussion, but I, I would uh, definitely be in favor of uh, of making sure that language acknowledges the the challenges of society and tries to address them. I I would tend to agree, Virginie, and I think at the core of I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> at the core of many sustainable development goals, yes, of course we want to get infrastructure and kind of keep moving in a in a positive direction when it comes to these nation building kind of bills that need to be passed. But at the same time, we have to look at the essential values of SDGs. Uh, and generally, that is uplifting um, populations that are disadvantaged. And that is, you know, trying to provide opportunities so that that empower um, women so that we have a more equal, a more level playing field. Um, that also ties into environmental um, gains as in more efficient energy sources. So there's, there's a whole host of values that are kind of wrapped up in the concept of these uh, sustainable development goals. And maybe not all of them are compatible with the speedy uh, political change. <laughs> but I think that we are making progress. I feel like just in the past year, there's been a sea change of recognition and uh, of embracing a kind of a, a more progressive strategy and a more progressive, progressive uh, agenda overall um, without it necessarily um, offending too many politically um, conservatively inclined uh, factions. <laughs> Well, I, I, I want to jump in because I don't want to discount the importance of politics in, in, mm -hmm. uh, because it is important. Obviously, if you're spending money, you know, on anything, you, you, you know, in your, that you're ta raised in taxes, it becomes political. Um, but compared to the business impact, the actual consumer, you know, consumers voicing their choice, Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, the money spent, you know, in in, in in, in regulatory frameworks, you know, pales in comparison to the to the people voting with their pocketbooks when you take them in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. um, so, if consumers have said we want to that this is important to them, and we will we will you know give preference to companies that have that have adopted this, um, you know, businesses are going to adopt it uh, because they're you know, they're market driven. They 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 will target those consumers and. Because the capitalists and Jerry's like seem not as good, you know, want companies that are going to be successful. They're going to give monies to those companies that can they can do that. And I think the overall impact, if we can sort of make STGs uh, part of the you know the, the win for everybody, um, mm -hmm. that's where it'll happen, regardless of regulatory. I mean, you can dictate it regulatory, um, and that'll be a slow win. But if you can actually embed it somehow into customer into you know consumer preference. Um, that sort of creates the the economics to be able to try and fulfill them. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, but you know, you know, we are, you know, I think, you, I, I mean, I agree with all this stuff. I'm just trying to posit some ideas that, you know, that are going to undermine 
you know, um, some of these objectives, you know, going forward. And I would argue that the consumers really aren't really there yet, right, where where you say they are. I mean, I know there's a cl- cross-section of people that are, but, you know, if you talk to real marketing executives, you know, the vast numbers of people at best are on the fence regarding this. And um, they're, you know, they're going to need the, this movement, this progressive movement is going to have to, you, you talked about the power of language, is going to have to be a lot more uh, clear about its objectives and how it plans to get <clears throat> And how it plans to deliver to the average person, you know, a product and a service that is going to make sense to them, you know, over time. And um, I think that the way it's going right now, uh, a lot of these programs and activities and language is going to confuse people. And there'll be, unfortunately, there'll be delays and rejection of a lot of this agenda. I, I think, I think you're that. absolutely right on a political level and on a policy level, but I do know in my capacity as a public relations specialist that um, especially working with med- medical technology and biopharmaceutical <laughs> and other companies that kind of have at their core credo um, integrity um, as, as really part of uh, image and the actions that they have to um, adhere to, um, they're being held quite accountable by consumers and shareholders and other stakeholders as to what it is that they're actually doing to advance certain goals. Many of them would be echoed here in several of the SDGs just that the UN is promoting, for example. Um, And also just from a communications viewpoint, for example, uh, it's no longer enough to just say that you support a cause. There's uh, definitely more of a mandate to actually show the actions behind that and show what kind of initiatives the companies are taking. So that's something in my career, in my 20 years in communications, I've never seen such a strong movement in that direction. So um, I think it is happening at a consumer level. I think it is trickling up to a corporate level. And I think the highest uh, ceiling to shatter there, Ned, as you might agree, is is that policy level where I think that's where things get a little bit more um, hard to advance. No, I, you know, I think the climate change movement has achieved its primary objective, and that is to get on the political agenda at the highest mm-hmm. of the countries. But now it's there. And now right. it's, got, it's got to be better than it ever was if it's mm-hmm. going to be successful. That's what I'm saying, right? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. And, you know, we're going to hear a lot about greenwashing, right? You know, Absolutely. there's going to be, you know, you take someone like BlackRock, right? You know, they, 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 you know everybody knows the head of BlackRock wanted to be the Secretary of Treasury or was pleading that. And everybody knows that BlackRock was actually managing the entire Federal Reserve Bank portfolio of asset purchasing for the country. So they were making tremendous amount of fees and they wanted to continue that in this administration. Right. And they also want to attract capital from, you know, the uh, the new millennial investor. Right. You know, particularly with passive funds like they have. Right. Exchange rate. It's all it's all part of the business. Right. To 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 do this. But they simultaneously announce a wealth strategy, you know, I mean, when they do all this uh, for China, right? You know? So, I mean, selective righteousness, you know, it leads to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy leads to, you know, sort of questioning and uh, an opening to basically reject the agenda. I, I think I think that, well, I think we're somehow getting in one step in there that I think it may help and may um, kind of steer these companies away from blatant hypocrisy. Hopefully, which is that accountability level that the stakeholders and those that are part of the organization, those that in in some cases, if they're a public company, are the shareholders are able to sort of voice their concerns and become 
activist from within. So that might be a little bit of a overly optimistic take on things, but um, hopefully it's something that we will see evolve uh, as it has been growing um, quite a bit in the last year. But I'd be interested to ask the investing, the investing people. I mean, the impression I get is that, you know, I think ESG is here for good. Don't get me wrong. I do. I believe, and I'm a, I'm a believer in all this stuff, right? But I just thought for the sake of conversation, this ought to be challenged because I hear nothing that challenges this stuff. But my understanding is, you know, still right now you're able to charge higher fees, right, mm -hmm. or ESG funds. Is that true? Jerry, would you like yeah. to speak to that? It's true. I, I mean, that go back to Stacey's, like, a social awareness of the young generation. <laughs> and uh, when investors select, you know, funds or ETF or mutual funds, they do look into your ESG factors. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, investors are willing to sacrifice certain, you know, returns and then in order to, you know, exercise this uh, sustainable goals. I mean, going back to my point, and so – Everyone need to be on board. It's just about the line of interest and it's about on the same page. And, and so, and Matt, I'm with you. So you, yeah. you need to be like policy changes, a top down approach. And then also, like this mentioned, this is from the market. So consumers pick the fair trade stuff. You know, they're buying coffee beans and, you know, it needs to be fair trade. So, I mean, everyone and, and not just from the stakeholders, shareholders, you, you know, you mentioned the black rock thing. Shareholders are going to push them, right? Not just act as hedge funds. And the individual investors, they're going to walk away if you're saying you're not doing the right thing. I'm not just here for the returns. And uh, I'm not picking the highest yield funds. I'm picking, you know, the short conference fund, you know. Right. And it's good for the planet. Um, I mean, right. it, once everyone is on board and uh, we're just, you know, for, you know, around the same goal. And uh, as, like I mentioned, we need to align interests. If it's our interests aligned, and we're going to towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no, I, I, you know, I just don't know if that's sustainable. I'd like to ask one question of our European expert. You know, like, you know, we, we, it's, it was sort of, you know, I was fascinated by, you know, there's a lot of things about the United States not signing the Paris Accord, right, for the environment. You know, and I, and I understood that, you know, uh, and it was blamed on Trumpism or whatever, something like that. But, but subsequently, the Americans found out that, you know, in the Paris Accords, China, you know, uh, was given a pass, right? And the United States asked, you know, that it not be given a pass, meaning China to give a pass. But the Europeans insisted, insisted on giving China a pass on meeting environmental standards, right? So the average American starts to read this, you know, don't really quite understand that. Then we find out subsequent to that, European Union signs a separate investment agreement with China, right? And they rushed it through right after the election of President Biden, right? You know, uh, and they have a separate sort of, you know, agreement with China. And then now they're willing to engage in pointing out some of the hypocrisies of China in terms of its human rights activity and stuff like that. So Americans are starting to read these things, right? And they realize, now, wait a minute, why did China get a pass on this? Of course, we should have insisted that they not get a pass. And that's why we didn't sign, right? You know, uh, part, one of the reasons why we didn't sign. And why is Europe doing a separate in investment agreement, you know I mean, with China, you know, while at the same time they hold all these values and everything like that? So what, tell me a little bit, and Americans know this now, and this is going to come up again. Right. So what are we supposed to do? Why, why are we supposed to embrace these movements when they're actually doing their own deals? Hmm. Who is European here? Well, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to take that one. <laughs> OK, so um, uh, thank you, uh, Ned, for, for offering the floor. I think um, there, there are several levels here. First of all, the SDGs is not a European thing, it's a UN thing, and therefore it's global. And it took years, years of negotiation, six years to get to, to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that the KPIs that are connected to the SDGs are very uh, modest. And even, um, we are not going to be able to reach them anyway, but... <clears throat> the 20, 
uh, 30 agenda would not be enough for, for the entire planet. So it was seen mm -hmm. as a little bit of watering down to get a consensus. Mm -hmm. The US, Europe, China were part of that. We were all part of this negotiation. Nevertheless, that was a big step forward. Now, there's another thing I'd like to say, and that may sound a bit strange, but it's the reality. There are two countries in the world that are really fighting for public value. Public value was a concept invented in the United States 27 years ago at the Kennedy School. And it considers, as I said at the start, society and the environment as active stakeholders of local administrations, for government and for business. And the two countries that are the most active in terms of public value are the UK and China. And, and, and really, they are trying everything they, they can do. But that, that I can give you data. It's, it's, uh, it's an objective fact. And it, I know it's interesting. So then you can put some, in, some, some interpretation. Is it because they have ruined their own environment uh, faster than anybody else? Could be. Uh, <clears throat> there could be that there's been some awareness uh, that came really uh, strongly. But nevertheless, a lot of um, MBA Chinese MBA students, they fly over to, uh, to the UK to learn about uh, how to deal with societal and environmental challenges in business. And, and you know, if we consider, I think we talked uh, separately, that 10% only of the big corporations around the world or individuals really think in these terms. If you take China or if you take India, it's a lot of people, 10%. It really is. And so I don't think we should really continue. And I'm a Cold War veteran. Don't, you know, don't, don't take me wrongly. I, I, I used to work in the transatlantic space and, and I used to know my place. But I think the new vision is global and it, it goes across countries it goes across business and, and in a multi-stakeholder way so that people who are like-minded, like everyone today at the Oppressive Forum, I agree with you, it's, we sing the same song right since this morning. We are the same, same song. But these people can unite. They can actually see, uh, help each other and understand how to work. And that comprises a lot of people from China, the United States and Europe, including Africa and everybody, you know, Indonesia, etc. So I, I have a, a slightly different approach than yours. Mm -hmm. I, I think that speaks really well to the, the global nature of all of these initiatives and um, that we're not each on an island and that this is something that we really have to work together and, and collaborate for achieving these roles, these goals and making them actually um, implementable. And I know that the media is, is not only an instrument to create awareness about the SDG agenda, but can also play a crucial role in the implementation of it. So um, I think that that's something that we may be able to come back and discuss at a later time as well, because <laughs> unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap up our discussion for today. Um, any last thoughts from any of our panelists before we uh, say our goodbyes? I, I just well, I would like to say one last thing. Just it's not, you know, again, I, I just think it's fun to challenge the it's just this whole sort of world that we all agree with, right? We got to get better. You know, we're at the top of the agenda now. And when you get to the big leagues, I played minor league baseball for two years, right? I never got to the big leagues. But if you get to the big leagues, you know, it all changes, right? It's faster. You, you got to be better what we're doing. But it's something to observe in the United States right now. Just observe it going forward. We are about to actually hand over the most amount of money in the history of our country, even including World War II, we're going to hand over the most amount of money ever to an institution in this country that, ha that is the lowest ranked institution in terms of confidence, integrity that we have in the country. And that's the U.S. Congress. 
It's the yeah. lowest name. No, <laughs> this is not a political statement. It's something to observe, right? It's, the yeah, most yeah. common light is, and, and so something, when you do that, something's going to happen, right? Something's going to happen. And I said, that's why it's going to make climate change activists and all of us who are engaged in this community is going to have to be better than we are to date. Amen. <laughs> definitely. It's definitely something to strive toward. Um, all right, then we have hit our mark. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to my incredibly insightful panel. And also thanks to Harassus for giving us this forum to discuss this really timely issue and ultimately challenge each other, even as we agree on many of the tenets and, and goals of the Sustainable Development Goals and ESGs. If you would like to connect with any of our esteemed